Okay, so now we're going to run um, step five in examples 2D subduction. There is a step five in examples 3D subduction, but it does not work yet. Um, if you run it, you'll see that the, the, in the very first time step, the nonlinear solve doesn't converge. Um, I will work, continue to work on this and see if I can get it to work. But in that 3D case, um, the nonlinear solve, based on what I've seen, um, it's going to take minutes, maybe even an hour, to run that simulation. Um, so, for the sake of being able to run the examples um, and, uh, and sort of show you something that you can easily run your laptop, we're going to go to 2D. Um, it's again a, a subduction zone. It looks very much like a cross section of uh, our 3D subduction zone. Um, these are new examples. They're step five and six. They've been added to the manual. You will not find them. There is a, uh, a note in the manual under step five that refers you to uh, the pages and sections in the 2D subduction zone. So step five is going to be a slip weakening friction uh, formulation. And then in step six, we'll use rate and state friction. This is what our 2D subduction zone look like, looks like. We built this uh, after the Tohoku earthquake. So we actually took a cross section out of slab 1.0 and created this subduction zone. Um, and uh, in this case, we put our, our, uh, our model is a, is a bit shallower and we have our slab going all the way down and it actually sticks out the bottom of the model. We have roller boundary conditions on the sides and the purple arrows are showing where we're gonna have uh, on the bottom of the slab, we'll drive it with a prescribed slip uh, at a constant slip rate. And then on the subduction interface down below, we'll have a uh, stable sliding. And then up here near the surface, we'll put in a uh, stick slip behavior, um, unstable sliding. Uh, and so we expect to get sort of earthquakes, a large slip happening occasionally up here near the top. We should have sort of relatively uniform slip rates down here at the bottom. And then we're going to be driving it with a prescribed uh, constant slip rate on that um, subduction bottom of the subducting slab. So now I'm going to let's we'll switch to uh, touring the parameter files in this case. So here's the Pilot app file. Uh, looks very similar um, to the ones we looked at yesterday. We have our journal information. In this case, uh, we're again reading from a qubit file, uh, set the file name. Now we're working in 2D, so we, instead of 3D. Um, so we have to set the dimension of the problem as well. Uh, we're gonna default to 200 years, one year time step. Our materials, uh, similar to what we had before, now we have a, although now we have a continental crust, an ocean crust, a continental mantle, and an ocean mantle. Um, we're going to uh, use elastic plane strain in the crust, Maxwell plane strain in the mantle. So notice that before we had elastic isotropic 3D, now because we're in 2D, we need the plane strain version of the elastic model and the Maxwell model. Uh, in our crust, uh, ID of one, and um, we're going to use a simple spatial database, um, Matt Con crusts that spatial DB for the material properties. Um, we're going to, we're in tr uh, using triangles. So again, it's, that's a simplex family of cells for a reference cell dimension two. Um, so the same thing for the continental mantle, ocean crust, uh, ocean mantle output. Again, we do subdomain in the domain. In this case, our domain is that entire cross section and the subdomain is just the top ground surface. And, and then we have sort of our default parameters here, but we're not gonna, most of these we overwrite in our step 05. So let's go to the top of here. So as we did yesterday, we're gonna set our parameter file, progress file. Um, we're using a nonlinear solver. Here in this specific case, I'm using a, time, a total time of 100 years and a time step of two and a half years. And I played around with, uh, based on the friction model parameters I gave it, how long did I have between stick slip events to, in order to get a couple significant stick slip events, how much time did I need 
and I adjusted the time step so that uh, thing, that the solution was relatively stable. If I take bigger time step, especially with stick slip behavior, it had trouble. The nonlinear solver, do, as it was trying to initiate this big stress drop event, had tr uh, trouble um, converging. So I started decreasing the time step into something that seemed more reasonable. Um, I, uh, based on uh, the solution, I should probably, in a real world example, to get really sort of a more numerical stable solution, decrease it even more. Um, and again, resolution of the mesh isn't as high as what I'd probably want to use in a real research problem. Um, our boundary conditions, we are going to uh, constrain um, basically roller boundary conditions except on sort of that west boundary. So let's get back to, so this boundary here on the west side, I've actually constrained it's uh, the X and Y degree of freedom because with the bottom of the slab coming out the bottom of the mesh, um, if I don't fix the vertical degree of freedom on this boundary, then what it basically does is it pulls the entire, the entire crust down with it. Um, sort of too much deformation, uh, much greater than I expected. So once I sort of fixed X and Y degrees of freedom on this boundary, then I got sort of much uh, what I would consider reasonable deformation um, within sort of above the subduction interface. So that was a case where I started with roller boundary conditions. I saw behavior that I uh, didn't like and I just thought was unreasonable. And so I added an additional constraint. Uh, faults, um, the top of the slab on the bottom of the slab, much like we saw yesterday. Um, the top of the slab, I mean, making, gonna, we're going to put spontaneous structure, so we change its top fault type to fault cohesive dynamic. The bottom of the slab, we're prescribing uh, creep, so uh, fault cohesive kinematic. Slab top, again, ID 100, a label, it's completely through going, so I don't have any buried edges. Uh, simplices, because we're using triangles in the domain, now my fault is only one dimensional. I'm going to use slip weakening friction, uh, and I'm telling it to force the healing equal to be true, so that uh, each time step uh, healing will occur after it, the uh, the slip has occurred. So the next time step, I would continue the stick slip behavior. Uh, I'm going to use a simple grid database for the friction properties. That's any variation of the friction properties with depth, and we'll go over this in a minute. Uh, my traction perturbation, also a simple grid spatial database um, shown in this file. Uh, HDF5 output, I'm going to, uh, now that I'm in 2D, I just have a normal direction and a strike direction. Um, uh, for my info fields, for the orientation of the fault, my data fields, I'm going to ask it to output the slip, slip rate, and the traction. Bottom of the slab, uh, we're prescribing creep. So we have an earthquake rupture with a constant rate slip function. I need to give it the uh, amplitude. So I use a uniform spatial database there for a uniform creep rate of eight centimeters per year. Uh, you'll notice it says left lateral slip. Uh, re uh, so in 2D, go back to on the bottom part of the slab, uh, in terms of uh, the sort of unambiguous way to specify I have the slip direction in 2D is to say whether it's left lateral or right lateral. So basically um, here for the bottom of the slab, even though it's sort of a normal sense, um, I think of this as just looking at one side of the fault relative to the other as being left lateral rather than reverse or normal. Um, because that works whether I have a flat horizontal surface or a dipping fault surface um, and whether it dips to the right or dips to the left. Uh, and I want the slip, uh, the creep to begin at a time of zero. Um, so I set the slip time and uh, the origin time to equal to zero and set the name. We're going to use HDF5 output right to uh, the HDF5 files. Now here are my solver tolerances. So the first thing you see, my relative tolerance, 10 to the minus 20 and 10 to the minus 20 for the uh, nonlinear solver. I set my zero tolerance to be 10 to the minus eight. Uh, I'm using the default value for the normal tolerance, which is actually turns out to be 10 to the minus 10. Um, in this case, really the fault doesn't open even though it's non-planar. So um, I didn't really have to, I didn't worry about the fact that 
since I didn't get an error that there was any opening, I just uh, let it uh, be with the default value. Um, with the zero tolerance of 10 to the minus eight, I want my linear tolerance to be one order of magnitude smaller. So it's 10 to minus nine, make my SNES absolute tolerance uh, one magnitude greater. So 10 to the minus seven. Uh, this is a, in this 2D case, uh, the linear solve does not converge very quickly. Um, Matt and I were talking about this on Saturday and the result, there, this is because the subducting slab, uh, basically we have three different, you could say sort of detached bodies in this uh, simulation with when the fault, we have two faults that penetrate all the way through the cross cut the entire domain. We have sort of this section over here, the ocean crust and mantle. We have the slab and then, uh, sorry, this is the continental crust and mantle. We have the slab and then the oceanic mantle. Um, and you can think of this, these three bodies, um, because we use Lagrange multipliers and with three going faults, they can actually move in sort of, there's a null space associated with movement of them relative to the other. The basic rigid body motion of the entire domain is constrained automatically in our solver. But uh, the, so the linear solver does not converge as fast as we would like because we have not, a, not accounted for the fact that these faults separate uh, and create a larger null space for the domain. So our linear solvers converge, but they converge uh, quite a bit slower than what we would like. Um, and so that's why we use uh, a num number of iterations equal to 1,000, which um, is usually much larger than what we would use in most, uh, uh, most of the simulations that we had run. Also, we give it uh, a large number of nonlinear iterations because we find that uh, in some cases, the nonlinear solve takes a while to converge. Yes. No, so there's so there's um, there's two there's two solves going on here. There is uh, there is the solve of the overall linear system for all the degrees of freedom, and then there is also this other linear solve that is going on associated with computing the perturbations in the tractions associate, sorry, the perturbation in the slip associated with how much we need to change the tractions to solve the constitutive model. So when you see friction underscore solver parameters, that's just that inner sensitivity solve. It's not the overall solution of the system. That inner sensitivity solve is very well conditioned. And so generally we can do, here i am set the max iterations to 25. Usually it's 10 or less iterations in the linear solve I don't even worry about the solver tolerances um, because it converges so quickly um, to such a small solid, uh, small um, residual. Okay, because so, so yeah. Yes, no, I understand. I understand. I don't think that's right. So he's saying there's two solved happening. What's confusing is if you output the view. Outside, there's a nonlinear solve for the basically the dimension that we use. And so the top part is referred to that. So I think Joseph Mars, 
basically saying that because we we talk about the solver tolerances in a friction model, he thought he needed to include the friction prefix. And so just we, in the documentation, we need to make it clear that the friction prefix is only, is only associated with this inner solve. And uh, uh, hopefully by including the, ex the example.cfg file, it'll direct people uh, better. Um, so that's the end of our parameters, and now we need to look at our actual friction model. Uh, so false slab. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the adaptive time stepping. Um, does, there's no feedback from the friction model to what it's a stable time step uh, in our current implementation. Uh, and so the, right now the adaptive time stepping is only getting feedback from the bulk constitutive model of what's a stable time step. And part of it's because we don't, there's no way to detect, I mean, uh, there's no sort of robust algorithm I know of to provide a in a quasi static simulation what the time step should be based on the coefficient of friction or the on um, like a slip weakening friction model um you know i think people could develop it and we would welcome people providing algorithms for what that would be um but uh part of it's mainly because uh you know in some sense slip weakening doesn't make a whole lot of sense <laughs> for a quasi static uh, friction model it makes a lot more sense in a dynamic rupture model where you're trying to actually follow um, you're using that slip weakening uh, parameter to develop a cohesive zone ahead of a propagating rupture front um, so it's a much more it's the slip weakening model is geared much more towards that um, and in this particular simulation as I'll show I actually use a d0 value of basically zero um, just because I want it to basically drop, I want to have a sort of a discontinuity between a static coefficient of friction and a dynamic coefficient of friction. Um, just, uh, and that was just, it's somewhat arbitrary, but I just want to enforce stick slip behavior. And so basically with a drop static to dynamic, basically I'm saying I want a stress drop equal to that amount. Um, so let's see, slip weakening. So here's uh, my simple grid spatial database. So I'm putting in uh oh, better make it larger so you can see it so um i put in just as a function of uh x and well there should be no z there's no z in 2d um, so we have an x coordinate y coordinate so anything above um minus five kilometers depth or minus five kilometers in elevation um I am going to have a static and dynamic coefficient of frictions that are both equal to 0.6. So that's going to give me relatively stable sliding. There's no stress drop there. Uh, and so my static coefficient of friction you'll see here is uniform with depth. My dynamic coefficient of friction above minus five kilometers is 0.6. Linear decreases to minus uh, to 0.55 at a depth of minus 15, stays at 0.55 down to minus 30, then increases linearly over 15 kilometers to back to 0.6, and is 0.6 for the down to the bottom of the domain. Um, slip weakening parameter of 10 to the minus 8. Uh, and I've used, well, <laughs> here I have inconsistent. Uh, I have meters up here. I want to make sure that's meters down there. Question. You can have a negative stress drop. Uh, it's the the issue is that in a slip weakening model, um, as more slip occurs, uh, it's 
the stable sliding generally makes more sense as a function of it's you would more want to do it in terms of a viscous friction model so a slip rate dependence so sort of the faster it goes uh to get sort of stable sliding in a um in a simulation you really you want the coefficient of friction to increase not with slip but with slip rate so that the faster it slips the more resistance it has because if you do it in terms of slip any amount of slip is going to increase the stress so it generally never wants to slip whereas generally when stable sliding if you were to sort of extrapolate or simplify rate and state friction is it will slip as the, it just takes more stress um, but it'll uh, depending on how much stress that controls how fast it slips uh, the more stress you put on sort of the slightly faster it slips but it slips at a stable so if you look at the equilibrium I think if you want stable sliding you really want a slip rate dependence rather than a slip dependence that's a good point um, that uh, negative stress drops um, don't work that well with slip weakening friction so that's our friction now we need to look at our uh, initial stress so I I'm not using gravity to put on a normal stress um, and so what I do is I basically just use the traction perturbation to put in a initial shear traction that's uh, slightly less than the threshold required to slip and then a normal uniform normal traction of minus 20 megapascals um, and uh, you can sort of fine-tune how much normal stress you put on and the change in coefficient of friction to give you what your stress drop is and how often based on your creep rate you would have ruptures so we have a, a combination of how fast we're driving it um, as well as the stress drop is going to dictate how often we have uh, large earthquake ruptures and generally immediately after a rupture i would expect my unstable region to have a lower stress than the stable sliding because there's a lower coefficient of friction during slip and so that's why i have put lower stress in the stable sliding relative uh, to the surrounding regions um, i could have put like minus 11.999 so it was just right on the verge of stable sliding um, but i put it just slightly below that uh, as an initial starting point, you can look at sort of the long-term ev evolution to see what uh, would be a more appropriate steady state value to start out with. Um, but generally, you're gonna, if you're gonna do an earthquake cycle, you need to spin up your model anyway and run multiple cycles before you really look at the physics. Um, so those are the parameters for this model. Are there any questions on our parameters? Yeah. So the shear stress yeah so if i put in zero i would have to uh, wait a long time for that shear stress to build up um, in this case i'm going to assume that you know the last earthquake didn't relieve all of the stress and so and i'm somewhere you know basically i'm putting my I, by putting in this initial stress uh values i'm saying i'm i'm well along in the earthquake cycle um, getting close to having the next event. This is because I'm using essentially an elastic model. I can uh, put in a, uh, basically in the, within the bulk material, I don't need to be consistent um, because it doesn't matter. Like my elastic, it doesn't matter what my initial stresses are. It only cares about stress changes. If you had a not, if you had a Drucker Prager, yes, you need. I would need to make a consistent uh, stresses both on my fault and it, actually, what, in that case, I generally impose the initial stresses in the bulk, yeah. and those get carried over consistently to the fault so, surface. Okay. okay, so we could do this in the bulk. Yes. And it would carry over. Yes. Which would make me. <laughs> Well, I wanted compressive initial tractions so that my fault would be compressive. Um, I didn't want to put any complicated spatial variation in. 
So I just put uniform values and then I, my coefficient, my static coefficient of friction is 0.6. So my static coefficient of friction times a normal traction of 20 is 12. So I wanted my shear tractions to be just a little bit less than that. Um, and then within my stable sliding regions, I decreased them a little more to make them a little farther from failure so that I would build up more stress before I generated an earthquake. is because uh, my sign convention is left lateral is positive. Okay. And, and, uh, and here on the top of the slab, I want right lateral yeah. motion. And so I make it negative to make it uh, to be consistent. Um, OK, so this actually takes uh, a little while to run. So I ran it. And so one thing I want to show you is that I, I captured everything uh, to a log file. Um, you'll notice that my log file is 16 megabytes because I d uh, dumped out uh, all of the uh, linear and nonlinear solves. So one thing I can do if I grep the log, whoops, grep step 05, you'll see that here is the output. Um, well, let me show you what the top of it looks like. So you'll see the normal pilot outputs moving along, all sorts of information. Okay, here's a linear solve. Takes a lot of iterations. Let's see, that was the very first one. Uh, not much happened. Nonlinear con solve converged in one iteration. So that means that tells me there was stick slip. Uh, the there was no sliding on the fault um, because when there's no sliding, I, my nonlinear solve will converge in a single iteration. Um, because basically, when it's stuck, when the fault is stuck, basically there's there's a it's just a linear elastic problem, um, just as if we had prescribed zero slip. Here's my next linear solve. Lots of iterations. And you'll notice that then it bumps out and tells me um, it's done one SNES iteration. It's got a, <laughs> here's the residual. Then it starts on the linear solve, which starts at about that residual. Um, so what I want to do is I can, um, and then at the bottom, it t I told it to tell me um, why the solution converged. So if I grep for nonlinear within my log file, every line with nonlinear shows up. And so for each time step, I can see why my nonlinear solve converged. It's always reaching the absolute tolerance. Number of iterations start out at one, then it gets 100 uh, up to a few hundred, then it goes back to one. So here I'm getting slip, probably a lot of slip here because it took the nonlinear solve a lot of iterations to converge. Now here I'm going to be completely stuck. Uh, big slip event, lots of iterations, small number, a little more. Um, back to being one, sort of another stick, another slip event, and then back down to one. So I'm, I have sort of three significant slip events um, that occur, you know, I don't, haven't resolved them very well in time, um, but uh, I'm using, that's sort of uh, a caveat on this that shows I have probably not really well resolved this stick slip behavior, and I would need to sort of fine tune either my discretization size, friction model parameters, to develop a more robust uh, sort of solution. Um, so let's look at the output. Um, in Paraview, and I, they're in, there's also a viz directory in here that, um, oops. So I will run it, I think it's, I don't remember which one it's supposed to do. It's bet reset to step. So we're going to do step five. This place will work. Well, well. <laughs> okay. So we'll zoom in here. Uh, we'll go to our last time step. 
reset what our displacements look like. Let's zoom in a little bit more. Well, first, first we'll give you the big view. So you see, you see the, can you see the stick and then the slip? The stick slip, stick slip. Uh, we zoom in a little more, whoops. <laughs> Replay it again. Oh, get away. You'll notice that in some of these stick slip, it's sort of one step. Uh, it sort of jumps, showing that it's not particularly well resolved. Maybe if I increase my slip weakening distance, I could regularize that a little more. Maybe not as big of a stress drop. Um, but uh, you can see that. Uh, my slab is doing what it's supposed to be doing and that it's driving. You see the deformation accumulating, pulling things down, um, and then the stick slip behavior is relieving the stress. Um, we got, I've exaggerated the deformation by a factor of 10,000. <laughs> and so as I, you know, you can, if you, if you do a scale of one to one, uh, you don't see anything. <laughs> so that's why we, unless you really zoom in, um, uh, so look at the, uh, it's in the manual, it discusses how we def do this in 2D and uh, it was covered in, you can look at the videos from I think, the last two pilot tutorials where we cover this example in um, uh, significant depth. <clears throat> yeah, in the previous, uh, I think two or three years of tutorials, we've covered the 2D subduction zone, the steps one, two, three, and four. And so this year we've added five and six. So if you wanna know sort of the prescribed slip or wanna start working in 2D, that's a good place um, to look in the manual. Um, it's uh, two or three examples ahead of the 3D example. So next, uh, let's look at the rate and state model. Um, but before I do that, uh, this is a plot uh, that I made with uh, matplotlib of the profiles of the slip as a function of depth with, for time slices. So each time step in my simulation, I've plotted the what the slip looks like as a function of depth. Um, so here you can see my bottom of my model is 350 kilometers. Um, I'm getting sort of, uh, I have the fault is stuck in the very shallow depths. We have relatively stable sliding. Then we get a big slip event. Um, you'll notice that here, you know, one meter of slip, uh, get a little sort of, maybe you call it a little aftershock, but that sort of goes over the, and my stick slip event is actually goes over the entire depth of the fault. Um, so even in my stable region, it's sliding quite a bit. That's, I think, a function of the fact that I had so much slip. Um, big stress drop, stick behavior, not much going on in the surface, accumulating, um, get sort of a, a significant sort of jump and slip at depth in that particular time step. Um, then another big slip event. Uh, the red lines are every 10 years. Um, and then uh, not much accumulation, and then another, it's probably close to another significant slip 